session today on peer review and ethics and research integrity perspective. I'm delighted to welcome our panellists here today who have a common theme, I think, amongst you of being advocates of open access publishing and indeed ways in which we can open up the, the peer review process itself. So I'm joined by Matt Hodgkinson, who is Head of Research Integrity at Hindawi, Tony Ross Hellower, who is the Scientific Manager at Open Air, and Theo Bloom, who is the Executive Editor at the BMJ. And as we heard um, earlier from Noah, peer review is really the evaluation of a piece of research for its validity, its significance, and its originality. Um, and that's also by people who are qualified to judge the piece of work, hence the term peer review. And really, we want to ensure that readers can trust what they read. I think that plays into what you were saying, Noah, about the reliable knowledge that people can trust what they read. Um, and it also depends that all people in the process act with integrity and, and, and the appropriate ethical behaviour. But the peer review landscape has been evolving and it's certainly um, a very much diverse place to what it was 10, 15 years ago. We're seeing new models of peer review, new innovations, new initiatives, some of them decoupling peer review from the journal. And that really addresses some of the criticisms that have been levelled at peer review in the past, that it's slow, inefficient and it's biased. But the landscape that we're in is increasingly complex, it's increasingly challenging and we see a spectrum of issues in peer review ranging from individual um, ethical mishaps on individual manuscripts, perhaps people are passing on their peer reviews for others to do, perhaps um, authors outraged with the process are outing peer reviewers online, um, right through to large scale instances of um, peer, peer review manipulation and fraud. So um, our aim with this session is to provoke discussion really about some of the issues we see now um, and how we've, we're beginning to tackle them and to look ahead to 2030 to see what sorts of things we could really do to make a difference and ensure that peer review is robust and that all parties behave ethically and transparently. So um, yeah, if we can kick off the discussion, Matt, would you mind uh, giving your, your standpoint for, for the audience? Yeah. Um so uh, the theme of the, the conference is looking forward to 2030, so I thought I'd be perverse and look back to 2002 and to see how that can make us look forward. Um, that was the year before I started working as a scientific editor. Um, what's changed? What stayed the same? Are there any trends and good practices we might be able to pick up? It's the same basics. The author submits a paper, the editor's assigned, they invite reviewers, they make an editorial decision, and the authors revise if necessary. That's the same basic structure of peer review hasn't really changed since then, although it has in some minority of cases. Um, we've had changes such as reporting guidelines. So the work on consort began all the way back in 1993, but it was the final consort was 2001. So it was about then that the first, that was one of the first big reporting guidelines in clinical trials. There's now 343 reporting guidelines on Equator, the umbrella. Um, We've had things like trial registration, which was introduced in 2005, so that you say when you're doing a clinical trial, here's what I'm doing when I'm doing it, not later, I don't fiddle it afterwards. And registered reports have been introduced on some journals like Cortex, Chris Chambers done work on that. We've got things like the Open Science Framework. Um, reviewers and editors can use those to look back and see the progress of the work. Um, there's been introduction of open peer review. That was first introduced, well, on scale in clinical journals, um, including the BMJ, um, Biomed Central. There's been slow adoption. There's also the Copernicus journals in 2001 introduced their interactive public peer review. So there's been steps towards open peer review in some parts of the scientific literature. It's certainly not widely adopted. There's even, um, usually it's single blind, but there's also double blind review in some parts of science where in economics that's quite standard. And there's been some research into that, but not definitively showing that any of those are particularly better. Um, there's even been steps to have no editor. Biology Direct was launched by Biomed Central. If you got three reviews, then it was published by the reviewing panel, regardless of whether they were ripping it to pieces or not. 
if the author was bold enough. Um, uh, uh, my own publisher, Hindawi, launched the um, ISRN, which is similar. Faculty of a Thousand Research now is post-publication review, and if you get two thumbs up, then you're in PubMed. There's no editor involved. Um, there's soundless only review. So is this a proper piece of science? Is it correctly reported? The BMC series was a pioneer in this back in 2001, plus one, who I also worked for um, in 2006 introduced this. So there's the idea of decoupling different bits of peer review. What do you review for? Is it impact? Is it soundness? Is it the correct reporting? There's now post-publication review, which is helped by the rise of online and open access journals. So if you can get hold of it, you can critique it. Journal commenting is pretty rare. It hasn't really taken off. BMJ rapid reviews are a rare exception to this. But now we've got finally things like PubPeer, which when they went anonymous, they doubled overnight their amount of commenting. And then you've got the named ones on PubMed Commons. That's now taken off as well. People were very skeptical about post-publication review for years, and it finally seems to have kicked in. But and this is helped by the rise of social media and blogs. These didn't really exist back then. This is now a driving force in the critique of science. You cannot just go, hey, everything's reviewed, everything's fine. You've got people tweeting at you, people blogging, and it totally changes the landscape for journals. We've got things like faking of identities, particularly reviewer identities. This is something that's massively increased. The first public announcement of this was in 2011. It may have happened before, but now it's industrialized. Journals are dropping using authors' suggested reviewers. We're verifying identities. We've got ORCID, but it's not validated, so it's not quite there as a tool to tackle this. But there's an improvement in knowing that identity is important. We built everything on trust previously, and we're moving away from trust to verification. Um, we in Authorship criteria go all the way back to about 1979 with the um, International Committee of Medical Journal Editors. They um, codified this in about 1988. It's still not really caught on to have structured contributorship, but now there's the credit taxonomy. It was just introduced this year. Can we move from the author list to saying exactly what people did, who provided the data, who provided the methods? Um, on to the industrialization of uh, misconduct again. We've got paper mills now coming mainly out of China and, and Iran, but elsewhere. Um, some journals getting swamped with these submissions. Um, Editors don't want to handle some of these submissions. So there's now tools brought in to spot duplicates, to spot patterns. Um, artificial intelligence may be useful for this. There's a session this afternoon on this. So we've now got things like peer review suggestion tools that were a, a dream back you know, 10 years ago. Those now, actually, <coughs> those now actually work. Editors can actually use those. There's machine reading of articles. Things like Content Mine and Penelope, a startup in London can read a paper, and um, there's the stat check, which recently was really controversial in um, psychology, went through 50,000 papers to assess um, whether uh, t-tests were valid. Um, we've got things like similarity check from Crossref, so plagiarism and fraud have always been a problem. They seem to be on the rise, but we're now catching them more. So is it because there's more, or are we better at catching it? Um, it's a mix of both, but the Plagiarism from Crossref was only introduced in 2008. <coughs> Before then, we just relied on people picking it up by chance. Um, we assumed good faith, and now we're introducing all of these automated checks. We've got checks for plagiarism. Do we need checks for images? Can humans spot that, or do we need software to do it reliably across the board? There's now data in review in some cases. PLOS has made attempts to do this, but it's not really reviewed much. Do we need to review the data as well as the paper? We're not sure. We've also now got infrastructure around all of this. COPE was founded in 97. The first code of conduct for editors was 2004. The flowcharts were introduced in 2006. We've, editors now have much better structures and networks to be able to deal with these topics. We have forums where we can bring together these problems and say, hey, have you seen this? Watch out for that. Um, it's something that didn't really exist before. The first World Conference on Research Integrity was in 2007. By 2001, we'd already had four peer review congresses, but mostly we're still in the dark on what's the best thing for peer review. So we've had few randomized controlled trials. The quality of the evidence isn't very high. So there's people like David Mower um, from the University of Ottawa working on uh, what he calls journalology, also the title of my, my own blog, where we people look at how you study journals and how those work. Mm -hmm. and 
we'll have more advances in that coming in. And now publishers have research integrity teams. I run one, Elizabeth's in one. These didn't exist 10 years ago. So publishers have realized we have to step up and fill this gap that we've had. Um, okay. So what can change? Well, you two can maybe <coughs> say some more on this. I'm not sure. First one to all that. So yeah, we can, I think that was a very comprehensive review, Matt, <laughs> of uh, some of the issues that are going on and the move away from trust to verification tools um, and checks. Um, Tony, I don't know whether you want to speak more to um, ways in which we can improve the peer review process and mm. tell us a little bit about what OpenAI is doing. Um, so my uh, background in this is open science. I work for an EU project called OpenAir, which is about um, fostering uh, social and technical links for open science in Europe. And as part of that, we've been looking at peer review and how we can bring the principles of open science um, into the world of, of peer review. So principles of transparency, accountability, inclusivity, um, the accessibility of results and work methods um, for the sake of re reproducibility and better science. Um, so in order to do this, um, we've had three main tasks. The first was to define open peer review, which um, although it's a term which we all use a lot, um, actually we all use it in slightly different ways. Uh, the second was to conduct a survey, which some of you may have seen was conducted last month. We had 3,000 plus respondents looking at attitudes to open peer review. And the third was um, experiments, small scale experiments into open peer review. So the the first plank of that, the, the defining open peer review, we collected 122 definitions from the literature. <laughs> um, we coded them against seven traits in total, and we found a total of 22 different constellations of, of these various traits throughout the definitions. We talk, when we talk about open peer review, we are usually talking about different things. And each journal, um, which has an open peer review system, has a specific flavor. Um, and the implementation of this, especially given that the, 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 the implementation, the ways to implement will differ by discipline. You can't implement the same system in every discipline. Um, people don't want it and it might not work. Um, it means that when we're talking about open peer review, very often we're talking about different things and that, that means it m makes it very, very difficult to compare what works in which situations. Um, the traits that we found, the three main traits, were open identities. So this is non-blind. Um, the reviewer and the author know each other. Uh, the, there are open reports, which means that the uh, review reports are published alongside the article. And there's open participation, which means that the review community is self-selected and crowdsourced in some way. And these are all tackling different problems. They're all tackling open science problems um, so, for example, open identities is about transparency. If you're giving criticism to somebody, it, it's, a, it's a scientific process, and you should be willing to stand by that, goes the argument. Um, it's also about accountability, being able to track back, and perhaps um, avoid biases of um, uh, social and cognitive biases. Um, open reports is uh, much more about um, accessibility of the, the work and enabling credit and so on. And then um, open participation is about increasing the number of eyeballs, potentially, that are on the work in order to increase the scrutiny. But in most cases, this doesn't happen. Open participation processes usually have very low uptake, and usually it's the, um, the rock star articles or the very controversial. And then, the, the, and then so the, uh, the normal science, the, 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 the incremental science, the, the um, yeah, this... Uh, may not be able to rely on such processes. So we found these different forms of, um, of openness. And then we looked at attitudes to these different forms of openness. Um, and what we found is, although open identities was present in about 95% of these definitions that we found, it was the, the main trait. And a lot of people still identify open peer review as open identities. This was the one with the most pushback. So. Um, 60% said uh, that open identities would um, make criticism less strong. 70% said that reviewers should be allowed to choose, so it must be a choice. 
Um, and yeah, only about 20, uh, about 30 percent, or um, less than 20 percent, said that they thought that this would make the um, system of scientific scientific communication better, or a little better. So um, uh, it's clear that with open identities, there's a very strong there's a strong pushback and, and a need for choice um, for for reviewers. With um, the other um, main result, uh, interesting result that we had was on inclusivity and open participation, that only a third didn't agree, uh, didn't think that everyone with sufficient knowledge should be allowed to review, regardless of background. So people are in favor of opening up the pool of reviewers. And um, this comes back to uh, talking about the ethics of review, what we regard as a peer. Because if we restrict our definition of a peer in the first place, then we are restricting our definition. We are restricting who is allowed to scrutinize the record. And of course, being allowed to scrutinize before it gets the journal brand stamp is a much different process to being allowed to scrutinize after. Because um, peer review has two, pro two uh, or three um, uh, functions, so it exists to, to vet the literature to, and to improve the literature. Once it's in the literature, there's not really a chance to improve it. There's a, a chance to um, correct it or, or retract it. But this process of is not malleable anymore, and it's fixed. Um, so I'll stop there. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Tony. <coughs> Can I just say how nice it is to have someone actually talking about data when it comes to peer review? <laughs> I'll come back to that point. I also want to say, when I um, made some notes, I didn't know you were all going to have these wonderful voting panels. So I have, a, a, like um, the speaker on peer review history, I have a number of assertions here. I would love it if you vote on what you think as I um, <laughs> go along. You can vote at all times, but I will try and um, indicate when I think is a particular point you might want to agree with. Uh, and I should say my, my background is I've been working in peer-reviewed journals for 23 years. I am very old. And in open access for 17 of those. And for those of you who think, yeah, open access, that's a real thing, 17 years feels like a hell of a long time to have taken to get to the point where we say, yeah, open yeah. access is a real thing, <laughs> and it's still not the dominant model. And probably those of us who were there near the beginning, as Elizabeth and Matt were, might have thought five to 10 years to get there. So now when I'm asked, what will things look like 15 years yeah. from now, I'm like, well, it won't have changed as much as you think, but if we keep fighting, we can make a difference. So that, that's my sort of starting balance between optimism and, and pragmatism. And, the, uh, and I think the peer review ties into all sorts of other issues around the scholarly communication ecosystem that are going to be hard to resolve by just focusing on peer review. Um, and so those will come up in what I'm about to say. My own view of some idealized future is that there should be a seamless thread from the doing of research to the reporting and talking about it. We should be able to map the methods, the data, and everything through to a publication on which there is, there is some commentary. So here's assertion number one for you to disagree with. Uh, David's disagreeing by leaving the room. Um, that it should be have open identities associated with it. But if someone is going to be commenting on work in the public domain, they should use their identity. Yeah, I had a feeling this group were going to be not quite like your, your <laughs> survey group. Right, so we'll, we'll work on the premise that actually it helps if you know who is making the criticism and where they come from, uh, rather than the, the anonymous commenting. I think we should be assessing at various stages from methodology through to narrative output. And we see that with things like clinical trials where the protocols are approved you know, ahead of time. And I think we're moving towards that in all areas where you don't just produce a package right at the end, but you have some kind of review going on along the way. OK, and this is, this is my big one. We have to have a clear separation when you're doing technical review and when you're assessing for impact. Anyone want to argue that those should be held together? I mean, it just seems like the system where you insist on those being done together doesn't work well. And for me, I suspect that journals will continue to exist, and their function will continue to be highlighting, aggregating, commenting on, building communities around the work that's being done. And those are all really important functions. 
but they are not about judging the technical soundness of the work that's been done, and that's a different function. And journals also have a lot of technical work to do, for those of us who were at a Crossref meeting earlier in the week, around you know, metadata and linking and standards and making things work properly, um, which I think often gets lost when we're coming up with wonderful new systems. But here, okay, here I really do want you to vote. Is it sensible having a link between a journal name or impact factor and your chances of promotion and tenure? Who would like that situation to continue? <laughs> okay, good. No. Oh, <laughs> all right, one minor revision just to, just to get a vote. But really, on the whole, unless we can break that link, then we get all these bad behaviours around publication and so on because it's so important. And I think it's down to the funders, looking at you, Robert, uh, to say we, we're simply not going to use that system anymore. And I know we'll be hear, hearing about how Wellcome's trying to do that. Um, I did want to say something specifically about medicine. So if you've been a participant in a clinical trial, are you happy with the idea that someone's going to post a preprint about your work that may include your personal data and all sorts of material that they shouldn't be making public? Right. So... <laughs> so a small number of people are, and you know, there is a kind of radical openness move that says, give it up, everyone's going to know everything about you soon anyway. But I think at the moment, when it comes to patient-sensitive information, claims about therapies from companies with vested interest, claims about the harms of a product like tobacco from companies with, medic with vested interest, there are all sorts of claims, and I don't think we want to move to a world where... It's the sort of Daily Mail bar of shame telling you about how to lose belly fat when it comes to looking for information about you know, scientific work that's been done. I think we still want to know what is a properly you know, done clinical trial with appropriate ethical constraints and so on. So I think there may be a bit of a special case for medicine, although I don't much like that argument. And so my final point is a plea for real research about what works and what doesn't. You hear a lot of publishers, and indeed a lot of scientists, saying we're doing an experiment around peer review. And they don't mean they're doing an experiment. They mean they're trying something new. And they might tell you what the results of doing that are or not. And they may or may not have any control. And they may or may not have any you know, predictions about outcomes. If we do real research, we can find out really important things. Like the BMJ did a randomized controlled trial of identifying and not identifying peer reviewers and they asked does it make a difference to the recommendations made to how polite the reports are to all the things that people care about and the answer was it made no difference to the recommendations made it did improve politeness by some subjective measure and it did slightly decrease the number of people who are willing to serve as peer reviewers but it made no difference to the rejection or acceptance of manuscripts and as a result if, since the journal believes it's a good thing to have openness that's what's going ahead. But it's really rare for people to say, we've, we've done, we've measured mm -hmm. the outcome. And I'll just flag up something that I saw is coming up this, this afternoon around training peer reviewers. Again, study has been done, published, saying what's the effect of training peer reviewers and then giving them a bunch of articles that have mistakes in. And the answer is very short-term improvement for maybe a matter of weeks. And by three months, they've all forgotten it and they're all doing it the same again. So, and they're still not, even when they've been trained, very good at spotting. Something like, you know, eight errors in a paper, they might spot two or three of them. So, you know, that, I personally, I don't think that's the answer, and I don't think that because there's some data to support it. So I would urge everyone to do real research and to present it at things like the Peer Review Congress, or there are now journals about research integrity and peer review, because just saying, oh, yeah, we tried that and it didn't work is not really how we should be doing our scientific best. Yeah. Okay. Present your data. Yeah. Great. That was Thanks. a fantastic um, different perspectives on some of the issues we face. I'd like to open it up to the audience and see if you've got any burning questions for our panellists. Do we think that opening up the peer review process is a good thing? Maybe we should vote on that. So... Yeah, so there are all sorts of different ways we can open up the peer review process. Um, even allowing reviewers to talk to one another during the process is a way of opening it up if you're not prepared to go the whole hog with open identities at the end of the process. Um, 
I'm also wondering about um, what you were saying, Theo, with um, the medical case, maybe, maybe probably putting medicine aside. Do we, do we believe that, I mean, some of the issues that we see that are faced on journals in peer review, um, we want to share with other people. And it's tricky to do that because peer review is confidential. <laughs> if we had a more open framework right from the, the start where people did deposit their work on preprint servers, would that, would that facilitate things? Should, should we be um, mandating that people deposit their work on preprint servers? Maybe that's another question. Yeah, Kate. Re ready to ready to be submitted to a journal, I would say. So I wonder if that, that's kind of a bit late. Right? We want to be encouraging people to have pre-registered so that we can start to even earlier. Yeah. So perhaps journals could start to say, okay, we're only going to publish stuff if we're the publicly available principles from us. Yeah. Mm. That would be quite radical. Like, I mean, that is what. Model, yeah, that is what happens for for clinical trials. Yeah. yeah. Well, although journals have backed away from it somewhat. There's, there's disagreement in, in medical publishing about whether you should require prospective registration because it leads to a perverse um, result that the aim was to reduce publication bias. So it's had a great effect that um, introducing a requirement for reporting guidelines on re uh, registration dramatically reduced the amount of positive results getting published, um, really dramatically, from like 60% down to about 12% or something. It, it, that was in an NAIH group. But the problem is that if you, on a technicality, go, oh, you, it wasn't registered, then you end up rejecting papers that weren't registered on time. So it creates this horrible bind where you like, what do I do? It, it exists, it may be valid, but I won't publish because it wasn't registered. So if you do that with the whole of science, then you may actually end up rejecting a lot of sound work. So it's, it's not an easy um, thing to tackle. Maybe you could just have some kind of badge of shame instead. To say that also that we're not only talking about science, of course, we're also talking about humanities and there would be some areas where such pre-registration wasn't, okay. wasn't appropriate. But also that we're talking about different things because this kind of peer review of the pre-registration doesn't require openness. You could submit pre-submit to some platform and you could have the reviewers peer reviewing this. But, so this is another form of openness, which is about the openness in time of the peer review. Like when does the peer review process, does it have to be one block right at the end? Or I think Brian Nozek from the COS, the Center for Open Science, has discussed this, that you have peer review at the start of the methods. The methods are good, then the study takes place, and then you're just ticking boxes. They, d they did the thing, and then you're checking the stats. Um, I just wanted to say um, also with regard to um, Elizabeth, Elizabeth mentioned open interaction, discussion between reviewers. This was another aspect of openness that we looked at, and this was by far the most popular amongst the editors, the reviewers, and the authors, all groups, that we uh, looked at. By far the most popular aspect of open peer review. But um, in many senses, the most incremental change as yeah, well. Yeah, it's quite a simple one to put yeah, in place. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But again, it, although it's in place at some journals, mm. I'm not aware of anyone having assessed what effect it has on the you know, the time taken to revise, the, yeah. the strength of the revisions, any of the things other than it makes the reviewers happier, may make the editor happier. Yeah. You know, there was one yeah. study, I yeah. just published a blog post, I think it was like one study. But yeah. I absolutely agree with this, that, um, that we need a, a, a common framework for the evaluation of peer review. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I would definitely be interested to work on that in the future, if anybody wants to talk about that. Yeah. Daniel, I think you wanted to chip in there. I had, uh, two points. I mean, first, I agree entirely regarding the research, and um, one of the big limitations I know of quite a few studies looking at exactly what Theo's just said they need to. The problem is there's a limit of tools on how to quant quantitatively look at this. There are only two, which is the RQI and the, the meta RQI, MRQI, is it? Both of which have in variable inter rate of validity, which really undermines a lot of these things. But there is a specifically one looking at reviewing. Um, the method separate from the result and seeing exactly what you just said, sort of does it speed it up, does it improve validity? The other point I wanted to address actually was Matt's comment, which I, I think while you have a good point that obviously there is then you could be rejecting articles in a technicality, 
The issue then is it's not a technicality. What you're rejecting them on is the fact that you cannot be certain that what they're telling you is the truth. As you've said, it's actually closer to 80% of the literature in biomedicine, at least, is positive results, and it's been getting worse. There was a systematic review done by Danielle Finelli in the, um, 2010, I think it was, that found that results have actually gone from 28% null non-confirmatory in the 1990s down to 16% by 2007. Now, as you said, registration is beginning to address this, and yes, it does have the issue that re su um, studies that weren't pre-registered wouldn't then be considered. But the whole point of this, the reason it's been introduced, is we know, beyond a shadow of a doubt, that people do switch outcomes, switch these things. So you're sitting there going, yes, but you have at least a representative sample. So while you may not have all the ar articles published that you could possibly want, what you're not doing is then muddying the water with articles that you cannot trust the findings from. Yeah, I think on that, actually, one of the kind of gold standards is not actually necessarily the um, registry entry, because even that may not reflect what was really done. It's actually the study protocol for a clinical trial is much closer to the truth. And so many journals will actually require the study protocol for clinical trials. It's very rare to require that for other study types. In particular, they just often don't exist for out, certainly outside medicine, you don't get study protocols as in a document that is approved by the Ethics Committee in the same way. But within clinical trials, then actually I'd put more faith in study protocols than I would in many trial registry entries. And to differ from that point, I Thank, completely agree. Um, but also we're starting to, I'm now starting to pre-register all of my psychology protocols, including my student protocols, um, on the open science framework with very clear primary outcomes identified just like you would in clinical trials and clear statistical analysis plans. And unsurprisingly, my primary hypotheses have not been supported in all of those so far. <laughs> um, and my experience of my colleagues is that quite often that is the case. So it, it, I think much of the literature, especially in psychology, that is out there that hasn't been pre-registered, we can be pretty confident that... It, um, significant proportion of it is false positive. So I think, yeah, it may feel draconian, but actually if you said to, to authors, if you don't pre-register, it's not going to get published, we're all going to quite quickly adopt methods where we start pre-registering. Theo, do you want to say? No, I just, uh, there was an interesting, um, uh, you, you may, th a slight tangent here, but about open data, because there are now, um, there's quite a lot of medical editors and medical researchers who don't want to share data, we talk about data parasites, the people who mine your data after you've collected it. And one of the arguments they've now come up with is, well, you guys keep saying we must register our primary outcomes, and now you want to mine our data for something else. Is that okay? Can we still mine the data afterwards? Um, and I think the argument is, yes, as long as you say what you're mining for, in much the same way. So that, you know, there are sort of brokers of, of open uh, data now saying, Tell us what you want to do with it ahead of time, and then you can do that analysis. Yes, if you're doing something that wasn't pre-specified, you state that it wasn't pre-specified. Yeah. So you are allowed to do fishing expeditions. You just have to declare that that's exactly what they are, rather, yeah. than, pre rather than pretending that they're what you were looking for in the first exactly. place. Exactly, yeah. yeah. Another question, thank you. It was a, a question relating to uh, preprints. I this is what working. Um, I've, I've always been a, a fan of uh, preprints. I, I was one of the first to, to use uh, Nature Proceedings and also one of the first to use uh, BioArchive. I think uh, preprints have really taken off this year, big style. And uh, one, I don't know if this is an ethical question, but it certainly ties in with one of the comments. I think it might have been Theo, but uh, one of you mentioned about uh, mandating preprints. What did the panel think of that? Uh, well, my, my view is, is, is more uh, like Kate's, I think, which was that a preprint is a very funny concept. I mean, it only exists because of thinking about print distribution <laughs> and a preprint being something that is before the article is printed. Um, it's already written as a whole article. And it's not clear to me, I mean, I, I'm fine. People want to post preprints, that's fine, and get comments. It, when I, you know, back in the midst of time when I was a scientist, you always circulated to the three or four labs closest to you to say, what do you think? any critique before I submit my paper. Um, and that's a, a fine and appropriate thing to do. But it's, it's quite late in the process. And I would much rather have openness earlier on in the protocols and in all sorts of things than in we've written this whole paper around you know, a, a structure around some data. 
and some, some approach, and then you can only comment on that whole thing. That's there is an aspect of um, preprints that is attractive, is that if it was mandated universally, then this would stamp out the practice of dual submission and dual publication, or it would help towards it. This is a difficulty that publishers have, as you can tell when something is submitted more than once to your own platform, and you can tell when something's submitted that's already been published, but you can't tell when something's simultaneously submitted. There's no mechanism that can tell you other than good fortune. Um, and having mandated preprints would help eliminate that practice. Do you yeah. have in, um, evidence? Do you know how, how big a problem that actually is? I don't think it's, I haven't seen any estimation of how big it is, but I mean, it's. Uh, anecdotally, it's, it does okay. occur. Okay. Yeah. It does occur. Yeah. So, some proportion of retractions are because of things being published yeah. twice. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, just to say one more thing about preprints is if, if for open participation processes, very often these rely on preprints, right? So, yeah. if you're going to open up the pool of reviewers and invite everybody to come and look, then you have to open up the manuscript in the first place. Um, so they can, uh, so they can, so they can see it. So um, some of these elements depend on each other, uh, and some of that is about whether you call that published or not. Mm. Yeah. I mean, you know, in essence, do you publish the article and call that post-publication review, or do you post it as a preprint and call it pre-publication review? Seems, you know, lost in a semantic yeah. morass there. Yeah. Yeah. Back to Daniel. I think there's another question. Five more minutes. Yep. <laughs> Last one, I promise. Um, I almost want to just put a question to, to the panel as it is, because you're talking about post-publication and all the fact that it's basically semantics, and it's possibly a little bit radical, but do you think the sheer concept of a final version is potentially undermining the integrity of all of this, and we should move, and we've talked about pre-registration, yeah. we've talked about preprints. you mentioned sitting there saying, you shouldn't just start with the final version, you should start with the methods. Shouldn't we move completely away from this and into yeah. living okay. and evolving documents? Yeah, we'll go to Theo first, is that okay, yeah. So we, uh, for when I worked at PLOS, and uh, Matt may have been involved, we did some sort of brainstorming about if you were starting again, how would you start now? And it seems to me the way you would start is, that you would have some narrative, the kind of narrative that says, my w lab works on this thing, and these are the problems we're interested in, these are the kind of approaches we take. And that would be the introduction to all your papers, and you very seldom need to change it. You change it a little bit, it says, and in 2016 we showed X. And then you do the description of the work, and that doesn't have to involve the, the introductory part, because that's written, and it doesn't have to involve, it's some methods, it's some data, and it's some interpretation, and you separate those, and you say this is interpretation. And the interpretation does need to be, as it were, time-stamped. This is what we thought when we did the work, this was the primary outcome we were looking for. But it doesn't have to hold forever as your view of the world, because your living document is your, and that we used to think this because we didn't know about the existence of retroviruses, and now we think that, or you know, whatever, and that that should indeed be a living document. My own view is that people want to tell stories. They need to tell stories, whether they're as posters, movies, videos, whatever form they're going to take. And you've got to be allowed to tell an evolving story, but that there is a value to saying, at this point in time, we did this work in this way. This is what we thought we were looking at. Yeah. Tony, do you want to chime in there? Yeah, yeah. So I ju just some uh, self-publicity, maybe. So um, <laughs> I wrote a blog post about this actually a couple of months ago um, on the open air blog called Disambiguating Post-Publication Peer Review. And it was about exactly about this. That, uh, and it's about our, the problem of the word publication, which is still linked to the print paradigm. It doesn't really fit anymore. And when publication happens. So I, and with the traits, I didn't, I had, and it was because I was trying to um, decipher these traits. And I, I split it actually into pre-review manuscripts um, and post <laughs> public uh, final version commenting um, and the, 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 the problem is that post publication peer review gets used for pub peer and it gets used for comments on a blog uh, on archive it's and these but these are very different things because as I said by the time you're on pub peer commenting about something you're talking about the fixed version um, and that blog article actually finished with um, exactly this point, that we need to stop thinking about what we call publication and hopefully, well, maybe we can find a better word. Um, we need to stop thinking about it as an event 
and start thinking about it also as a process, a yeah. continual process, because even after you have your quote final version, it can be sub um, maybe the text is then fixed, but the reputation is subject to constant um, evolution. And, and that reputation is what makes the article. It's the esteem that is held in that makes the article. So we don't have a fixed version. Um, but at the same time, and, I, and the idea of living reviews, for instance, would it need to be brought up to date. But at the same time, I think it's important that we have deadlines because we don't get stuff done otherwise. And, it, and having the final version, that's a really good time to tidy it up and make it look, put it on its best face. And also, in the humanities, um, one of the comments on my blog was from someone, I think, in history, um, who's, who said, um, but in the humanities, you have to have a final version because you can't, because the, it's about continuing the conversation. And you have to have a fixed version of what you're in, in the person you're talking with is trying to say in order to build on that. You, um, so, and I, here again, we come back to the, the disciplinary differences. I'll stop. I, the comment you just made made me think of one of the advantages of pre-publication review, the way it currently is done, is that you can guarantee that at least one person in a reputable journal has actually looked at the article and approved its publication. <laughs> so whereas with, with a kind of voluntary community review, there's no guarantee an article will ever get reviewed. Whether that's a good thing or a bad thing, it's you know, up, up for debate, but there is that <laughs> one advantage of pre-publication review is there is an editor chasing down reviewers and getting things published. Um, otherwise, people go to other journals. So there is that level of competition there that actually helps it function. Um, on versioning, there's a technological issue. Many journals just don't have very good platforms for this. Um, there's also resistance to being able to ch should you be able to update things. But there's also the, yeah, the sociology of it. Working at PLOS, I found it very difficult to get authors to engage <coughs> with post-publication critiques of their articles. They just were not interested in it because that blog post was not peer-reviewed. <laughs> the, the, so there's this, there's so a, a real mindset needed. Cl um, it's a <laughs> mindset, and there's a conservatism among many researchers that's very difficult. They're not like us in this room. They're not interested <laughs> in these things. It's done. It's dusted. And even if they could update it, they would not. They will put their head in the sand, and they will just go. It's fine. It's in the journal with the impact factor. I'm, I'm not revisiting. I, th I think, yeah, I think we're going to unfortunately have to leave it there. We could just probably go on and on. We're just getting to the point of uh, really into the nitty gritty. Um, to try and sum up some of that, I think Theo is right. Looking back, how much has changed in the last uh, 15 years, looking forward, I think we're probably going to see, if we were to make some predictions, more openness of the process, more experiments would be a great thing to call for, more data to back up these pilots people are trying, and more openness at the start of the process, right through from uh, registration, preprints, um, we'll continue it on. So we'll have to come back again. <laughs> Thank you, everybody, and thanks very much for the panellists. Thank you.